just as a sesame seed is filled with oil, so too is the nature of the mind pervaded by primordial wisdom, ultimate and self-arisen, dwelling within it as the youthful vase body. The latter is, however, constrained and hampered by the ordinary aggregates, the elements and sense fields, karma and negative emotion. The natural luminous wisdom body, the multicolored lights, the primordial wisdom, and ultimate reality are consequentially obscured, with the result that beings fail to behold what is in fact their own true nature. Nevertheless, thanks to the essential instructions of highest Ati Yoga, the sovereign vehicle, even ordinary people, are able to glimpse this nature, their own self-arisen primordial wisdom within the luminosity that is spontaneously present. Thus, the crucial point of Togyo, the path of spontaneous presence, is the self-arisen or primordial wisdom, here symbolized by the syllable Hung an explanation of the seven-line prayer according to the innermost secret great perfection, the heart essence of luminosity. Page 65 of White Lotus, an explanation of the seven-line prayer to Guru Padmasambhava by Jamyong Mipam, translated by the Padmakara Translation Group. This is Darren Littlejohn. You're listening to the 12 Step Buddhist Podcast, episode 58 Soulmates in Sobriety, and continuing with Practices of a Bodhisattva, number 16. If someone whom you cherish as dearly as your own child takes you for an enemy, then, like a mother whose child is sick, to love that person even more is the practice of a Bodhisattva. Well, so we can. We can imagine that suffering, you know, if, especially if you're a parent, if you have a, a child who's taken you for an enemy. Uh, there could be no greater pain. You give your child everything. They're born. You sacrifice yourself for them and love them and care for them. Do the best you can, and they take you for an enemy. Or perhaps you didn't do the best you could. Perhaps you were terrible. I don't know. We've never met. There's a range of possibilities. If someone whom you cherish, however it is, as dearly as your own child, and someone who you really care about just can't see you, can't see you for who you are, just let that sink in. And because what we're, we're working with and what we're dealing with here is our experience, right? So you can have some esoteric book and you can read stuff and you can kind of like put your thumb and index finger together and sit straight up and kind of think you're doing something. But none of this has any value if we can apply it to our daily life, to apply it to our recovery, to our path. So we really do want to kind of think about it and meditate on it. Like, wow, what, you know, can I empathize? And can I sympathize? Can I feel compassion for that? And maybe it's happened for me or maybe it's happened for someone else or maybe I've never known anyone personally, but I can just imagine and cultivate that sense of compassion. Wow. And okay, now, now that I've been able to connect with it in someone else, right? Now I can bring that back to me and say, okay, if I have this experience of love and devotion and caring and just willing to give your life for that person as if they were your own child, and that person is like, hiss, bah, you're evil, bad, go away. You know, you go, I, okay, I got to feel that. And then I got to turn that around and go, ooh, then, <clears throat> like a mother whose child is sick, to love that person even more. Wow, you really like a mother if you haven't had the experience of parenting it's hard to understand i think but if you maybe if you've had a puppy things like that or a sibling but the understanding of that closeness and like i i love you beyond your human um 
obscurations. You know, I, I love I I know something about the Dharma, and the Dharma teaches me that. Well, as as we read in the in the in the seven line supplication, you know, we have we all have these karmic obscurations. You know, and in a sense, my voice right now, the things in front of you, what you think and feel, what I think and feel is all a magical illusion, a display of its tricks. It's a trick of light. It's a trick of the light. It looks solid. It looks real. We think it is. But, you know, sometimes when you turn like off to the side somewhere, it hits you that it's not like that. And you may have direct introduction or transmission from a from a, a qualified guru who's realized the true state of, of realization, as it mentions the Ati Yoga, and you may have that or not. And it says in the text, it's even available to the ordinary person. Well, it's available to the ordinary person, but it's really kind of impossible if you don't really have a solid connection and a solid commitment. And that's why we have the Bodhisattva path. You know, the Bodhisattva path is part of the higher path. In other words, I need to work with the merit that I accumulate through good works, but I'm not doing it for that reason. I'm, I'm doing the merit for the pure joy of it. Okay. And that's what Yangtze Rinpoche over at my Tripa Institute in Portland taught me. Darren, don't do a hundred thousand prostrations out of duty or obligation. For it to work, you have to do it with joy. So I invite you to mull that over a little bit, continuing with today's topic of recognizing your soulmate. The first sign that you've met your soulmate is when you suddenly think, oh, look, that's my soulmate. Knowing intuitively that you're meant to be with someone is different from hopefully wondering. You'll know when you know. The sense that you've been made whole when you're with your soulmate will be an unshakable conviction. It doesn't always happen instantly. You might have known somebody for a year when things change and you go, oh, look, that's my soulmate. You'll share a lot of Me Too moments, and your life goals and values will complement each other gracefully. Yes, opposites attract, but with your soulmate, you'll find a strange conviction to journey on together. Every time you hold your soulmate or even make prolonged eye contact, you will feel the timelessness of the universe and the safety and completeness that your soulmate brings you. Some couples have called it home. Time will contract and dilate around your soulmate. Space will warp and all kinds of mysterious phenomena will arise when you're together. That might sound like hyperbole, but it's just the way it is. The magic of being with the right person is like no other magic I know. Zana Blaze, the angels of love, magic rituals to heal hearts, increase passion, and find your soulmate. Be careful, this is potent magic in this book. Don't play with it. <laughs> Don't play with it unless you want to be, unless you want change. And change, trust me, change will happen. I don't work with, I don't dibble dabble on stuff that's bullshit nonsense, you know, as you should know by now, I would think if you've listened to anything, if you haven't, well, hey, welcome to the podcast. I do have the ability to get some interviews going uh, here soon, and I would love to have an interview on some of this stuff. But what I want to talk to you about, we're just going to go back to this paragraph. You'll know when you know, um, knowing intuitively that you're meant to be with someone is different from hopefully wondering, and you'll know when you know, look. What I want to talk to you about is addiction. This is the 12-Step Buddhist Podcast. I'm an addict. My, my deepest soul sickness, my deepest addiction ever was um, revealed to me as an addiction, not from the bullshit that I told myself it was, okay? But not because I'm a bad person telling myself, but because I have an ACE score of like really high and I'm like traumatized by hot, cold behavior and passive aggressive and all kinds of stuff. So in my circuits, you know, that's what's there. And in my circuits, when I meet that, you know, Bobby Earl said, you know, in the old tapes uh, from his AA talks, you know, I'd see her across the room and that glint in her eye that I knew was magic. And later he realized it wasn't magic. It was psychosis. 
So we have these in, in, inner, deep inner things that we feel are in our bones. But what we want to do in recovery and through mindfulness and through discernment and through practicing the, the paramitas, you know, say of patience, generosity, various degrees of success with those, I've written books about them, patience is my worst. Um, but through the mind trainings, then our ability to discern, we were able, coming at it from different angles, you have to approach the Dharma from different angles. You have to approach your inquiry in an open way, in a multifaceted kind of spherical you know, uh, <clears throat> open, 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 open way. Yeah. And the more open we are and the more trusting we are. So we have to learn how to sit and be still with our own suffering and be still with our own trauma and be still with the vibrations that echo from ancient karma millions of lifetimes ago. If you listen to teachings, you know, this is how, this is how we think about it. I used to say when I was doing these sh shows and doing my groups and, and my, um, my retreats and so forth, that this is what they say. And you know, this is what this is what we say. This is what we say. I'm I'm in I'm a practitioner. This is what this is how we are. I was trying to make it more syllable. You know, this is how they say it in Buddhism. I don't know. Consider the thought. But I, I don't care about that anymore. If you're not interested in truly committing and truly changing, then go I, I can't help you. I have no interest in even having a conversation with people who haven't done work and aren't doing work. Who aren't, I have really no, I really have nothing in common, you know, so other than obviously our common humanity and, and, and all the things that we do to practice spiritually in the Bodhisattva path, but in terms of like hanging out and spending time and, and that, you know, unless I'm doing something to be of service, no, we're not in, we're not in that ballpark here. Let me, so, sorry, I accidentally with my super cool uh, uh, Sound Studio One skills deleted a story that I'm really trying to tell you, which is the 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 depth of my addiction okay so i couldn't see it i had to have a practitioner who came out of nowhere i believe a manifestation uh, to come to me and give me uh, something that was gonna i needed to hear from a human being in front of me and she looked at me piercingly and said you're a fucking addict i don't want to hear your bullshit about love this is addiction and everything that i came up with everything that i said to her about this um, she just looked at me and was just like, she was like wrathful Dakini, you know, just giving me this, um, unrelenting, penetrating realization, just like an alcoholic would looking at another alcoholic who's drinking and you're sober and, and they're giving you the bullshit and you're like, bro, <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it's the same thing. They, she looked at me that way and she told me the story that about how the depth of her addiction went and how she said that they had dreams at the same time and he gave her everything and then he slowly started manipulating and controlling and then she got to the point where she would just do anything and 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 uh, to be with him and and she just thought it was the most important you know thing in the in the in the universe even more important than her own children and and she even said to me she looked me right in the face and said I would have sold my children to be with him. Now, I understand the level of addiction. I'm not saying it would, the same kind of thing. I'm just saying that she, it took me years after that. But her, her energy, her transmission, her seed, her message, trust me, stayed with me. And it, it, it it's what enabled me eventually to really consider and see it as the addiction that it really was. And that's the story that I accidentally cut out. So there you go. Why am I bringing up such horrible visuals? Because the nature of addiction that I experienced with trauma bonding, uh, Stockholm syndrome, uh, narcissist um, hijacking or kidnapping, emotional kidnapping, a lot, you know, the the level of addiction that I had to that I couldn't see until it stripped me of everything. So that's the reason why I'm trying to share with you how bad it can be. It can be bad, like, you know, heroin addicts or gamblers and people lose everything and all kinds of addictions, right? Well, the one to a person when it's a trauma bond, when you're in the suffering and you stay willing and you stay in it because you're addicted, 
That is the worst I've ever experienced. Cigarettes were nothing compared to that. So now that I'm free of that and I have discernment, I have self-compassion, mindful awareness, years of healing, lots of space in myself, then I can discern now. I'm not a newcomer, brand new to sobriety, going, oh, I know it in my bones. She's the one. You know, she's the one to, um, I don't know, you'll see. You know, I mean, I, we, we've all done it. And, we, we, and if you've been in recovery for a while, you know, you've seen it enough times. The point of it is that we can discern. I'm not trying to bum you out about whether or not a soulmate is possible. On contraire, mon amis, I am trying to spice you up and get you jacked up on the idea you can recognize a soulmate. You can have the real deal. You can find it. It is available. You have to know when it's the real deal and not your addiction. For me, I had to lose everything. Like I said, there was a guy on the YouTube talking about this, a counselor. He said, you know what? Some people, you know... Some people don't reach a threshold. The, the the narcissist cluster B, you know, malignant narcissist, borderline personality, will push you beyond your emotional, financial, mental, and spiritual limits until one of two things happen. You reach a threshold and you stop it. Hey, does this sound familiar? Or it stops you. Some people have no threshold. They wind up dead in jail, in prison because of the narc and how the narc manipulates and exploits you. If you're vulnerable and you're a you know, child of trauma and they exploit you and you have nothing but love and you really want to give it, that's fuel and that's food for them. There's a lot of books about this, but we just lived through some presidency of it and all that. So I think everybody's kind of got a taste of what gaslighting is. Now, I don't have to explain that shit to you. So just know the difference within yourself. You know, am I tripping am i wishful thinking you know it says right here um knowing intuitively that you're meant to be with someone is different from hopefully wondering all right so i'm 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 gonna be honest obviously i want it i want to be jacked up i'm an addict and i want the high i want the feeling i want to feel connected i'm lonely but i have to know if my shit is real or if it's hype that I've made up or the other person, or if it's one of these things that, you know, I'm being tricked again. And it's easy if you're a traumatized person to say, Hey, it's, I'm being tricked again. I don't have any, you know, and I'm going to obviously say, I mean, for men, the stats are lower, but for women, it's, you know, it's like one in four in recovery. I've had, you know, some kind of sexual trauma and that sort of thing. So, I mean, it's, it's obvious, you know, to women, probably more than men, I would think, at least maybe it's more obvious to you than me, if you're a woman, that, yeah, you got your guard up. Yeah, you don't know, you know, who you can trust. And yeah, there's a lot of trauma and a lot of triggers, you know. So it's there, but it doesn't mean we can't be whole. And it doesn't mean we can't heal. And we can do the magic. And we can work the magic. And check this book, The Angels of Love. But be careful with it, you know. Just know, though, that you can. You know, when you start feeling those me too, synchronicity, out of body, um, kinds of experiences, just check yourself. Maybe check with your circle of, you know, your circle of safety, your sponsorship group. However, you, uh, in compassionate recovery, I kind of, re, I completely retool all all of that thinking, um, for myself on paper and for you, you know, to understand. You know, it's a, it's a different way, like sponsorships. You know? You're finding a circle of safety of people that you trust, and, and that can be dynamic and fluid and change, and you can have different relationships, but. Circle of trust, circle of safety is something for, you know, to consider for people with ACEs a different than when, you know, when you come into recovery and they tell you, sit down, shut up and listen and do what we say and do what your sponsor says. And it's a lot of like weird kind of well, layering over projecting a lot of their own trauma. I saw it for decades. So I wrote a new book, Compassionate Recovery. It would be awesome if you would read it. I know it's hard. I know you have to do your work, but I think I also know that you don't want to die. So what I'm saying, I'm not trying to be dramatic. I just lost a lot of friends who have died because they couldn't get recovery. They couldn't get recovery because the information wasn't there for them. Therefore, the support wasn't there for them. Therefore, the training wasn't there for them. And now they're dead and I love them and they're fucking gone. So maybe you don't want to be gone. Maybe you want to stick around. I'd love for you to stick around. 
And thank you so much for listening to the 12 Step Buddhist Podcast. Thank you for all of the reviews. 4.5 star rating for the 12 Step Buddhist 10 Year Anniversary Edition up on Amazon. Got five out of five star rating, um, but just eight reviews up there on Compassionate Recovery on Amazon. Love some more ratings and reviews. The ones that are on there are real. It's just that the thing is that the work is hard to do. I know it's going to take a while for this book to get out there and hit and sink in, but it needs to be in treatment centers. So if you're in a treatment center or you are you work in a treatment center, email me and I'll send you a free copy of this book. Hard, hard, you know, paperback copy, not a digital. Okay? Info at compassionaterecovery.us. You know, I don't have unlimited resources for that, but I want this in treatment centers and I will give you a copy. And you see if it works, because it'll work. This is all your information. I just kind of culled it together and synthesized it and tied the strings together and connected the dots and put practices in there for you to internalize it and you know try to put it in a, in a kind voice for you to, to understand your own inner and develop your own inner voice for healing. Well, Gal Dangy, shout out to Mississippi Jenny over there. It's 21 minutes in 47 seconds so i'll wrap it up a couple seconds early for you i do want to thank you so much for being listeners for all these years and for following and i hope that you're enjoying as much as i am the awesomeness of the new revelator pro sonic mic uh or presonus revelator it's so awesome built-in compression i can go pop pop click click you know dip it a doo wop pop 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 it's not too bad it's not too bad. So I hope you love it. I'll continue working on the sound. But hey, listen, enjoy yourself. Look for your soulmate. Follow the breadcrumbs. Say a prayer. Make sure that you discern between your addiction and your hopeful wanting and your intuitive recognition and acknowledgement of your soulmate as you're on the spiritual path. They will join you and be your spiritual partner. Because after all, isn't that what soulmates are? All right, everybody. Peace out. And... Namaste.